Welcome to the Automatic Identification Teachers Institute Virtual Edition, brought to you by the Material Handling Education Foundation, AIM, and the AIDC 100. So, RFID safety concerns are the principal thing that the FDA was concerned about in 2007. And Dr. Jay Epstein, who is director of CBER, the Center for Biological Evaluation and Research, uh, basically hit me straight between the eyes with the following. You can do all the testing you want to do with RFID tags on blood bags, but you can't transfuse a single unit of that blood till you prove that exposure to their RFID reader radiation hasn't compromised either the safety or efficacy of that blood product. Well, there went my next three years. We, Dr. Epstein at the, then introduced to me to three other gentlemen who are sitting in this uh, large presentation room as being from the Center for De Device uh, and Radiological Health of the FDA the people that regulate uh, basically RFID usage in healthcare, and they also regulate X-ray machines and MRIs and anything else that uses um, either a, uh, an electronic or a uh, X-ray or any other kind of technology to which the body would be exposed. So the three groups, FDA, CBER, which were the blood people, CDRH, which were the electronic people, and the Blood Center of Wisconsin uh, worked uh, diligently for about a year to develop test protocols. And what we came up with was a protocol we call a limit test. And the idea is really quite simple expose a small group of blood components to higher reader power levels and much longer times than would ever be seen in practice. And then assay blood samples. In this case, it was a 24 hour test and we took product samples at seven and 24 hours and assayed these samples against unexposed biological controls to see if there is any change in the cellular morphology or biochemical change. Now let's translate that into something we can do. Uh, first of all, there were three parameters here. One was RF exposure time. In this case, we're talking 13.56 megahertz. And <clears throat> so this is a magnetically coupled system Normally, a, a powerful uh, compliant reader puts about a signal strength out of about one amp per meter magnetic field strength. And if you look at the total, that in terms of total RF exposure in joules, we'll call that 1x. In the limit test case, we had a continuous RF exposure over 23 to 25 hours with a break between seven and eight hours for assaying the sample. And we used a magnetic field strength of five times, five amps per meter uh, that the uh, largest compliant reader would have. And so the total amount of RF energy that the blood bag received was 330 to 360 times normal. Uh, why is that so much? Because we anticipate that a blood bag might have a total interaction with a reader of 20 minutes over its entire lifetime. And we were testing it to 23 to 25 hours. So let's look at how we tested it because uh, you're going to probably 
uh, be asked to do this kind of thing in any other kind of biological application for which you use RFID. And this is the apparatus we use. I designed and built a 13.56 megahertz Helmholtz coil. And you can see it on the right. It's made of copper refrigerator tubing uh, encased in plastic. And <clears throat> it has, we found out that it was very hard to tune a continuous coil. And so we segmented the coil and made it uh, several different segments, uh, which were all connected with high voltage capacitors. Uh, we simulated the RF uh, pulse sequence from an ISO 18000-3 reader at about 100 watts RF. And uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about the secret sauce. The biggest problem with this coil, even though we had a um, 10 ohm series resistance, is the impedance of the coil is about, oh, maybe 0.1 ohm. And we put two 10 watt resistors, or excuse me, 200 watt resistors, those brown things you see in the upper right picture, in series to raise it to 10 ohms. And then we found the whole problem of matching a 10 ohm uh, coil to a 500 ohm source had already been solved by the ham radio operators. And we found that a standard ham radio automatic antenna matching system was the key to connecting uh, the RF system uh, to the uh, coil. And it worked extremely well. For those of you who know RF, okay, if you look at the uh, uh, plot uh, of the impedance versus frequency, it was just absolutely magnificent, perfect circle, looked like a DC resistance. And that made matching really simple and it made control of the RF uh, very insensitive to what blood, or blood product you put in the middle of it to test. So we spent two and a half years of testing. The first test we did in 2007 was the protocol that we'd agreed upon. We were testing fresh uh, red blood cells and fresh platelet products. And what we found that they had no increased cellular or protein degradation and that dual heating um, by magnetic induction in this case had an acceptable temperature rise in the products around one degree. So we weren't risking compromising the product through dual heating. This is again, a huge concern when you're talking about using uh, UHF RFID. Well, based on the 2007 results, the FDA requested additional tests on plasma components. Now, for those of you who don't know, the plasma is the fluid in which the red blood cells are contained, and it's usually separated from the red blood cells. The plasma is often processed for coagulation factors for treatments of diseases like hemophilia with factor eight. Aged red blood cells near the end of their life, we were very concerned that the cells might be more fragile and that they might suffer uh, some damage to RF exposure that a young healthy cell would not. So the FDA asked us to test all these plasma components and test aged red blood cells against young ones. And we found that the aged and the young red blood cells were consistent. So that eliminated that concern. Uh, plasma temperature rise was acceptable. I think it was around one or uh, less than two degrees C. But the coagulation factors, which are separated from plasma, 
like factor eight, we assayed them uh, before and after and during the tests, uh, the limit test, and found that there was no impact on uh, the factors in terms of any biochemical change or reduction in potency. Okay, at that point, we all heaved a big sigh of relief. And the results led to the first US approval uh, by the FDA to deploy RFID in a blood bank. And that's what we'll talk about now. Why is all this stuff important? Because these are all the other things one must be concerned about in using RFID, particularly around any biological product like blood. So we developed a two-part RFID application. One part is for the blood center, which is where the blood is collected and processed. And the second part was in the hospital. And the hospital part turns out to be pretty important as well. Sorry, getting dry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. And fortunately, it's easy enough for me to chop out these little pauses and whatever else. If you need to get up and stretch and walk around for a minute, that's cool too. No one will know the difference. Okay, great. All righty, we'll carry on. Okay, I'm going back. Yep. So let's look at this now in terms of those two parts to the application, the blood center and the hospital. And there's also an intermediate in terms of shipping and transportation, which is a time where the product may be out of control of either. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, the donation site in, in Wisconsin, it's typically in a church basement or at a, uh, in a company uh, cafeteria. The donation site is where the blood is actually collected from the patients. Not all blood is collected at the blood bank. Uh, many of it uh, is connect, collected at blood drives and sometimes in blood drive mobile vans. The next step is getting it to the blood center for processing and manufacturing. Manufacturing basically, in the blood banking terms, means separating out components and plasma. So it turns out one of the biggest sources of error was getting donations and the four test tubes associated with the blood bag all to the blood center without anything getting lost or mixed up. And as we analyzed the collection process, we began to realize that the place to put the blood uh, RFID tag on was at the collection center, not at the blood bank after it was received. Because we put it on at the collection site, then we could eliminate a lot of errors uh, in uh, transmission of the product from the collection site to the blood center. Now, those four test tubes that they typically take when they collect blood go off to t for testing. And that testing takes place in parallel with the manufacturing process, the first one of which is you take the blood bag and stuff it into a centrifuge and it separates the red blood cells from the plasma. All the manufacturing assumes that you're working on a safe product. And at the end of manufacturing, you get the testing results and you decided whether to keep the donation and do final labeling and put it into inventory or discard it safely. Uh, for example, if, uh, testing includes 
today COVID testing, but in the time we were de uh, developing this product, uh, HIV testing was just starting to be routinely done everywhere. Now it's in inventory and maybe it sits for 20 or 30 days and then the unit gets requested by a hospital. Uh, that unit is taken out of inventory and shipped, uh, put in a shipping carton, uh, as we can see in the lower uh, right hand corner, put in a refrigerated shipping carton and taken to a hospital. Um, and then it's transfused, the point of use where it's actually given to the patient. And we're going to use RFID as a tool for streamlining the efficiency and ensuring safety and traceability at all of these steps in our RFID applications. What we found, and this is something that's more appreciated in people involved in the process, is that there are certain pain points in all operations. A pain point is defined as a process area where there is significant room for process uh, efficiency improvement or process quality improvement or safety. And in the case of the blood bank, uh, we have three, we have actually more, but in general, those three come down to efficiency means reducing the amount of labor or time wasted, which reduce costs. Uh, again, product wasting, uh, for example, a lot of stuff that used to come to the blood center from the donation site was mislabeled. And the net result is we had to throw it away uh, because we didn't have the proper information on it. Uh, we reduced that dramatically by moving RFID out to the collection site. And risk mitigation, and that's usually a matter of improving on a manual process, but it's also a question of having data in real time. Um, and it's going to be particularly important in the uh, hospital. I won't read all this stuff. Um, you're welcome to look at the presentation later. But the real issues largely were reconciling data with physical reality, making sure that, for example, when you loaded a container that had 30 blood bags in it, uh, that you actually kept track of only those 30 in there. Uh, there weren't 31 or 29, and uh, that you had uh, a trace of the data in a product manifest that actually corresponded to what was packed in the container. Um, a big issue is physically locating products, and that doesn't sound like a big deal, but you've got to remember all the blood bags are in refrigerators kept at about four degrees C and all the plasma is in refrigerators kept at about minus 30 C. And so if you want to find a particular bag of plasma, uh, you really want to use RFID to quickly find that in the freezer. Um, you know, even in Wisconsin, uh, we're, we don't take well to staying in freezers for long times. Another issue is the opposite situation. When a blood bag was taken out of a refrigerator for some reason, for example, in labeling, and it's somebody forgot to put it back. And we can use the computer to remember when it was taken out of the refrigerator and note that it was not returned in the appropriate uh, 20 minute safe interval. So uh, the last one turns out to be a huge issue and that is misshipment of uh, blood bags to the wrong hospital or 
non-shipment. It's still lying on the table someplace. And a blood bag is worth about 200 bucks. And about, uh, oh, about two or three percent of the time in the existing barcode-based systems, okay, there are shipment errors. Things are put in the wrong cartons. People forget to pack certain things. And RFID's ability to read multiple tags in a closed container turned out they have a dramatic impact both on labor, but also on safety and operational cost. So here we are. Right now, we discovered that process reengineering of the barcode based processes totally changed the uh, dynamic of an RFID based system. First of all, now we put the RFID tags on the collection bag. And so it's used all the way from the time that a patient's arm is connected to it and through uh, collecting all the test tube and bag containers and taking them to the pickup point. And then when it gets to the blood center, uh, taking it and doing check-in using RFID rather than barcodes uh, had an enormous labor impact, but also a accuracy impact. Let me give you a very simple example of a pain point. In a barcode-based system, typically at a collection center, uh, when they connected the patient to the bag, they wrote down the start of collection time. When they disconnected the patient from a full bag, they wrote down the uh, collection end time. In the old barcode-based systems, uh, you would get about one or two percent of those bags coming in with either missing one of the collection time elements or having them reversed. And that was pretty obvious. Uh, so you really could not trust the data that you were getting. Uh, here, we, by using RFID, we, the RFID was recording the time in the handheld reader and so it recorded it electronically and automatically uh, onto the RFID tag on the bag. So now the bag arrives at uh, check-in and uh, for the donation and we read the RFID tag and it has all the information on all the barcodes and all this additional information like the start and end of collection. That took a process that took about four minutes per bag with a lot of manual data entry uh, subject to error and reduced it to a less than 15 seconds, including handling time. But it also meant that since we were using electronically generated start and stop times for the collection, that now we had accurate information in the RFID tag and we didn't have to throw away one to two percent of the donations because they didn't have the correct data. What we did find is that once we got the bag into the blood center, the barcode based processes for separating blood from plasma, processing the plasma and everything else worked so well that we really didn't get any big improvement in operations in the blood bag from RFID um, until we got to the last step, which was putting it into inventory. And I'll show you why that is important. Because the, uh, the efficiency of check-in was improved dramatically by reading one RFID tag versus five or six barcodes on each one of them. 
And things like tunnel and chute readers allow you basically to take a tray or box, pass it through uh, the reader and read 20 or 50 or however many things are in that container all at once. The, and then the um, couple of other things like returns processing and when you get blood from another center called an import, again, we put an RFID tag on it or one was already there and automated those processes which had previously been manual. So the hospital pain points are really coming down uh, to pretty obvious stuff, okay? And that's identifying the correct patient, uh, reconciling physical data, tracking time and temperature, particularly uh, in and out of the cooler, you typically have a hospital blood bank that may serve several hospitals. And so it gets transported from a central site to a, a point of use refrigerator. And that takes time. And you want to make very sure that all the blood's been handled in there properly. And so rather than going through this stuff in detail, let's take a look at it in a more macro way. A hospital blood bank, which services its hospital, uh, and it may be a very large hospital. For example, uh, John Hopkins is the largest hospital blood user in the world. They use a million blood units a year, partially because they do some rather uh, elegant surgery. But it comes into the hospital blood bank, and at that point, it's available. And it typically is put into a remote storage or, it, if, or into a central storage. The remote storage is for stuff like O negative that you want to have in a remote refrigerator right next to the ER. And... Once the blood is assigned, it goes to the patient floor. Now, over on the patient floor side, where we see point of care transfusion mass, that's pretty important. First of all, that patient had to be matched in the first place. And so using the wristband and an RFID tag uh, on the wristband, uh, and putting RFID tags on the test tube set makes it very clear to, that the patient has been identified and the blood has been identified as well. And so now that you match the blood and assign a blood unit to that patient, now is where things get interesting because you have what's called an augmented three-way match system which is something that has been enabled by RFID much better than it could have been done with barcodes. What's this augmented three-way matching system? Okay, our goal here is to ensure three things. That the correct product was ordered by the physician for and delivered to the patient and that this is indeed the patient for whom that blood unit was ordered. In other words, we're matching the patient, the doctor's transfusion order, and the blood product to ensure that we're transfusing the correct blood to the correct patient. It's basically automation of the chain of custody. And again, now we want to ensure two-way traceability. Uh, so now we've got traceability to the patient receiving it. And the IT systems uh, all along the way handling that blood unit should have maintained the chain of custody electronically. So if the patient has some adverse reaction, 
we can go all the way back to the guy in uh, Alp Alpena, Michigan, who donated that unit and find out, did he have the same thing? Is this something that was transmitted in the blood? So this is very important for our, a hospital viewpoint because the primary benefits in the hospital are not necessarily um, operational efficiency. The safety justification is the main reason for doing this in the hospital. And we'll actually see some statistics of that later. Okay, now we know what we're gonna do with our FID and we know how we might use it. Let's take a look at how we actually implemented it uh, over the period 2010 to 2012 at the Blood Center of Wisconsin. So that's all we have time for in this episode. Please join us in the next episode when Dr. Holberger talks about the results of the blood bank pilot tests. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe, like, and we hope to see you next time on the Automatic Identification Teachers Institute Virtual Edition. Music